What's your name? Cool. Wow. Cool. What are you from, Sama? What are you from? Cool. She sometimes she say London, London, and sometimes she said Surya Halab. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Welcome. <laughs> just yeah, I'm just, just <laughs> afraid of the for, for Sama. So, uh, how did you survive? Uh, how did you survive? Why did you survive? Why? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Just natural instinct, you know. Have a, <laughs> Just, <laughs> have a seat. Love to keep breathing. Yeah. <laughs> That's how we survive. <laughs> <laughs> Just stick to each other. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. I'll start with <laughs> yes, you, Ed. <laughs> I'll start with you, Ed. Uh, because we'll pass uh, the time together. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, let's sit down. Let's sit down. And mommy's coming. There, just while the family settle in, there is a huge achievement in reducing so much footage to create a viable, absolutely searing, completely coherent film. Well, I mean, everything really comes from these guys, first and foremost. The amazing, amazing work that WAD did and what she managed to film and just the lives these guys lived. And I would also really like to mention our two amazing editors who are actually here, who um, were with us on the whole journey of two years, <laughs> which was along Simon McMahon and Chloe Lambourne, two of the greatest, two of the really greatest documentary editors there have ever been. They, they sat with us in a dark basement watching some incredibly tough stuff between Wad and I having various conversations. And um, yeah, so they did an incredible job. But really, yeah, it's all about these guys. Wad, well, this has already uh, won at least 24 national and international awards. And I wonder what do you want your film to achieve? <laughs> Uh, actually, it's uh, the same things where, why, when you ask, like, why you survive. And I really do believe that there's something we should have the responsibility to make it reach out. Uh, because we survive not, not just be, like, uh, because the destiny or the God or whatever, it was really like the reason of that. But because I really do believe that we are here today to tell you all that what you've seen in this documentary, it's uh, didn't finish yet. And we've now survived and we are living here a very great life. While as we're speaking exactly, there's three million civilians are being bombed and threatened to death in each moment. Uh, really now in Idlib and uh, the countryside of Idlib in Syria. So it's really a big responsibility and big message that what's happening is still happening. And we should, all of, of us, do something uh, to make these people survive and not just being a refugee out, but survive in their homes with their dreams and with better future for them. And when, I, when we were besieged in Aleppo, uh, we didn't know what will happen next, and we really we watching the news around the world that we've seen an incredible people around the world. They were protesting against what was happening in Aleppo, and they were like have the signs about save Aleppo and save the people there. And we and all the people, I will speak on behalf of all the people who were in Aleppo at that moment, we do believe that we own our life for these people who've never met, but they were really care about uh, our lives. And that's why we ha we we here now. So what we should do now, uh, like next, really, to care about the people who stayed there and do something to ma make them survive as we are now. Just just on the human front, I mean, to be removed from that place, and to finish up here. In, in Britain, how are you coping? You live in East London, but I mean, it must be very hard to move on. Yeah, like the, the best things that we come from East, uh, Lond uh, East Aleppo to East London. So we've enjoying this to just say anyone who asks us, where do you live? I said, East, 
but not Aleppo, East London. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to, to have our normal life, but at the same time, like, as I've told you, because it didn't finish yet, so we can't really start feeling that we are now survive and we want to, to feel our, our life. Mm -hmm. Today, just one of the uh, big activists who started the revolution and who was singing all, all the uh, songs at the beginning of the revolution, he was just killed today. And we feel, you know, like this guilty about why we are alive and why we're still here while there's many, many other people who still like being killed and tortured and then also like arrested at, in the regime areas. So it's, we've tried, of course, all our best to do good life for us and for Taima and Sama, but at the same time, there's really big, big responsibility. Right. Well, now, could, could we have the lights up and we'll see whether people would like to ask any questions from the floor? Is that possible? It's very hard to see any hands. Yeah, in, 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 on the side here, yes. A could. very, very obvious question, but what can people do? You know, people want, who want to do things, what should they be doing? What can I do? What can anyone here want to do? It's really uh, what I was mentioned now, because uh, if the world before in 2016, they didn't do anything and they, the people around the world didn't protest and say, uh, make some noise about what was happening in Aleppo, we will be just like being killed, all of us, and with big massacre in silence and don't, no one will know anything. But when we, the people were protesting and make all the things that we are as a human being, we are look at this place and we are watching what's happening. So I think this is the only w way w w why Russia and Al-Assad regime tried to make it, you know, uh, they've been kill killing us, but soft as much as they can. And this is exactly what we can do now, like just like shed the light on Idlib and what's happening there. They are not tourists, they are like people who are Syrians. And, uh, you know, these people, like these children or women or uh, even sometimes babies inside their uh, like mothers, as we, what you've seen in the baby born uh, scene. These people couldn't be tourists, and we, whatever uh, the, the side they were in, but we should just try to, you know, I was just telling today a, a small word about, okay, if the regime and the Russian wants a battle, at least like make it a little bit moral, you know, of like not bombing the schools, the cities, or everything. If you want, not at least not the hospitals, you know, like you can do, Whatever you want, we know. Like we we have uh, both sides, but at least do it. Uh, I don't know. It couldn't be humanity, but at least uh, with some. Uh, I don't know. I I think you understand what what I was saying. The the ironic thing that as what just said, that uh, we became at a point that it's okay like to be as Syrians to be bombed, but please not to use chemical weapons. Like it's okay to be bombed with explosive barrels, but please not cluster bombs. It's okay to bomb like neighborhoods, civilian neighborhoods, but please at least don't bomb the hospitals. And unfortunately, like in the past, maybe like the battle on Idlib started like two months ago, and more than 20 hospitals were bombed, uh, like hundreds of thousands of civilians were displaced out of the city, around 200,000 people. And unfortunately, all the like news channels, most of the, like we're just driven by the Russian and the regime propaganda that like they are our terrorists, kill them all, that's it. And uh, like there are, uh, we at certain point, I myself like have lost faith in the international community, the Security Council, all of that. But I've never like lost hope in people the Syrian people and all the other world people, we are humans, we're driven by our, like, the morals, to just, like, if they're going, if the people in, in Syria are going to die, just at least don't make them die, like, silent. Just make as, as, as much noise as we can about it. The next question, yes, here. <clears throat> can, can microphone front row. Thank you so much for your amazing work. Um, I'm here today with my husband, who's Syrian, and um, I was working in Bab al Hawa as a dentist in 2013, 14. I was not inside Syria, but I was. I saw a lot of people leaving, and Syria is very close to my heart. And 
I know that this war is bombs, but it's also become a war of information. There's so much propaganda, so much lies from Russia. I'm wondering, like, how, how can you... I mean, your work is one example of people have to start listening to Syrians, stop putting your political background and, and getting things so wrong. But how can we fight against this Russian propaganda that's telling so many lies about what's happening in Syria? Thank you again. Thank you for your work first and for being here, for married to a great Syrian man. <laughs> but uh, it's about yeah the, the fake news that the regime and the Russian all the time trying to, to make a, uh, like their propaganda about. It's all about something uh, was happening on the ground sometimes, and sometimes it wasn't at all. And as they, f f since the beginning of the revolution, they were saying that uh, like there's a protest with like 20 people, and then at the same time they were saying there's nothing. The nothing mean really nothing, you know, like that they, they can't see that happening. And when they've seen that and they couldn't ignore that, they started to say it's a uh, terrorist and people are not Syrian and blah, blah, blah. So all these things, it's, it's become with the time, uh, like uh, let's say like fought by uh, normal activists or journalists who came into Syria to, to tell the stories, like Marie Colvin, which she did, like she paid her life for this. As we try to do as the White Helmet and Last Man of Aleppo films and many, many other films. So it's more about uh, individually, how we can really uh, tell uh, the word from one person to another, uh, share these stories with other people, and uh, you know. And at, but at the end of all of this, we are fighting between two sides which are not equal at all. And what you've seen in the last uh, like five years, you can see what, how normal activists that they've never had camera before, like my situation now. We are now like uh, go, going through all the festivals around the world and telling the story, while all the regime and the Russian sides. However, was their work? They've never had, um, like, let's say, um, uh, like welcoming from people outside, out their audience, which they are just the people who were pro-Assad or pro-Russian governments. So I think it's already uh, been uh, clear, you know, like it's even if it's not really uh, make difference on the ground exactly, but people around the world, they really knew these stories and they really uh, knows, and it's very clear which side you are like, will, will uh, believe. So it's just more about how we can, as a human being, share these stories and tell it to, to, to each other. Can I just, yeah. sorry, I was just gonna add, because I think there's a connection between those two questions and it's so difficult, I think for us, being in the West, you know, and we, we want to help Syrian people and we're confronted by this fake news and sometimes it can seem completely overwhelming. Like, how, what can we do when you're faced with these forces that seem unassailable? And I think there is there are no easy answers, but what I feel personally is that, and what I hope that people take away from this film is that we all have a stake in the fate of Syrian people, you know? And the same, we have to draw these links between what happened in Syria. It's the same governments that then are trying to distort our elections over here or who are accused of using chemical weapons in Salisbury, you know? We have to start making these connections and say, this is not, you know, this is not just uh, uh, confined to Syria. This is humanity, you know? And we are all facing these issues of fake news and these governments, these autocratic governments that want to essentially undo our, our value system. And so I don't know what the answer is, but I think my feeling is we can draw inspiration from these guys and from Syrians, you know, who in the face of absolutely overwhelming military force and terror, stood firm, stood strong to what they believed in and kept on fighting to make things better and we all need to now join their struggle basically and stand up for the values that all of us hold dear this is where a <laughs> this, this this is where a political uh situation chimes with uh, our own industry uh, the, this film received the highest award of any documentary in Cannes right? And uh, it's nominated, I'm not sure yet whether it's, we're hoping, we're hoping it will be nominated for an unmentionable prize. Um, uh, but but the, point, the point is that we have it within our power to use our own voting and the rest of it down, you know, all these contests, the rest of it, to keep pushing this film forward. 
because the more people who see it, the more it will be easier to tap people's interest and persuade them to move against the authorities who are failing to do anything at all. Our own government, totally useless on this subject. Uh, you know, I, I'm sorry, one has to speak the truth. There, so I can't <laughs> That's not for quotation. Um, the, <laughs> no, but but uh, we have to use the structures we have to completely keep the light upon this film because within this film is this terrifying truth. And if it can happen to Syria, uh, you know, a place of great development before. I mean, wonderful arts in in, in uh, Damascus, but in Aleppo, the greatest souk in the Middle East. I mean, the greatest market in the Middle East. A wonderfully vibrant community beautiful city, wonderful citadel, just smashed to pieces by the forces that have all been ready, re referred to. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Any other points? Anybody got a brilliant idea? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yep. Sorry, I couldn't see you. Hi, yeah. Um, just uh, making a comment to what you were saying about what you can do. So we work in mental health, work with the silent seekers and refugees. So we can do the clinical work. So if you wanted to help uh, the Syrian community in this country, it's setting up uh, community groups, ensuring um, they've got the right paperwork, helping them put their roots down here, I think would be really helpful. So yeah, there's a political side of it, but actually in a community basis, um, uh, supporting them with English classes, for example, getting them uh, integrated into society, I think would be really helpful from a psychological perspective. So, thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to add something on that. I totally agree with you because one of the things that I think the film has like uh, shed the light on that Syrians are humans. They are, for the last few years, Syrians have been like stamped with that terrorist ISIS. If you see Syrian, oh, are you ISIS? Are you from Raqqa? Ah, then you are ISIS. So there'll be just those like prejudgment on, on the Syrians regarding all of that. And at least like if we just deal with them, all the refugees, like we're talking about 10 million people, not all of them are just like, we're like taking the chance to just get out of the country and live in the heaven of, of Europe. Most of them were literally like dragged out of Syria and brutally displaced out of their homes. So like, thank you for these ideas. I'd like to do two, two things before we uh, to take a couple of other questions. And I just would like to deconstruct the, how this film was put together because it is an amazing achievement. Um, I, I mean, we'll come to you in a moment with how you shot it, but confronted with 500 hours of, of, of images. Well, I mean, the, the great way that the process began was actually Wad and I sat together in a hotel in Istanbul and with Timer, who was only about three months old at the mm. time, and we just went through this material. And that began this incredible process, really, of uh, collaboration between us, where... And it's hard to drive. He was thinking that this is the last one. Yeah. So they were she like, brought, ah, this I is the one, too. So. She brought two new shots out, like, last week. She was like, why didn't we use these? I was like, please, no more shots. <laughs> but, um, but I think, you know, we've been working on it together for two years, and it's been an extremely tough process and a robust process of both of us pulling in different directions in terms of, like, uh, me pulling, trying to make it accessible to Western audiences, and obviously you pulling you know, from the Syrian point of view. Maybe you want to pick up with that. So I really, yeah, I, I was really wanted the film to be uh, like, it's my story, but I want really to be our story as Syrians who lived that experience. And I wanted to cover all the points which I really felt there. Uh, so we've tried all the time to have uh, the moment when it's really um, worked with, with the film as a film. And uh, also about, we, we had a very challenge with the, uh, graphics, uh, which, how much can we put at, in, in front of the audience who they've mm. never seen something like this. But at the same time, we also always uh, also need to uh, describe the moment as it is, as how, how I've seen that moment. Uh, and I wanted people outside to see this. And I wanted also them to understand that this is not uh, uh, like something happened uh, you know, like with a, a plan. This is suddenly you've seen your, uh, you, yourself in, in front of all these like maskers. 
So we really had a lot of really different and difficult um, choices with, with all, the, all the process until the end. Yeah, and I mean, when you had an extraordinary archive of the kind that WAD had put together, there were so many actual films within it. There was the film of Aleppo, there was the film of their lives, there was the film of the hospital and their friends. And I think a lot of the process, and it's, you know, I, I don't know how we got there in a way because we just had to feel our way in trying to get this balance. And initially, because we started working, you guys had only just left, I think, like three months, I think, we met um, afterwards. And so there was a journey as well in terms of their place within the film and their story and, and Samra as well. And it was just a long process of discussion and working with our two amazing editors, as we said, and our incredible exec producers. We had a small but brilliant team that helped us get there. And within the film, the doctor and the politician, the doctor who knew what had to be done, both medically and politically, to try to win. How did you manage to cope with this extraordinary contest within your soul? Uh, most of it because, like, I always planned to, be, to become a doctor, but like, I never planned to become a doctor in a war zone, running a hospital there, with all that chaotic. So I feel most of, uh, so when we started to, to, to protest, I know that media is very important because like we need to, to tell the world what's really happening. And uh, that's when like maybe Al-Quds Hospital was the only hospitals who allowed all the journalists to film there freely. Like our rule in the hospital was we welcome any journalist anytime, while other hospitals might be, and they're very right about that, might be like uh, suspicious, like the regime might bomb the hospital or anything. But my point of view was to always tell the world what's, what's going on. And uh, after the, the siege of Aleppo, I realized that the, these like dead bodies and all the injuries were will, will still coming if we didn't make a noise about it. And that's when I started just to focus not just, but start to focus more on uh, on the media. So I always like during the maskers, I'm at the emergency room, but then I'm upstairs having several interviews with with several channels. It didn't change a lot, but uh, from what I've heard that uh, from people like in, in 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 Turkey who have a little relationship with the Turkish government, that uh, the the Syrian and the Iranian plan was always to to take to just, just destroy Aleppo. They, they had never planned to, to evacuate the people, while under the, the pressure of several people in several, and governments and the, the protests that happened all over the, 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 the world, the, the Russians start to negotiate, no, we should, like, we should just let, let the people out. Any qu more questions from the floor? R yes, right, right, is the one right up at the back there? I couldn't see. No, yes, there is. I think I can see a hand. Oh, one, one uh, shout out if you've been there for ages. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's very uh, well, difficult to see. Th thank you so much for an extraordinary film. I'm just curious to know, as Sama grows older, when do you think you'll be ready or she'll be ready to see this film? Uh, this is the, really the most difficult question I've ever had. And <laughs> I've had it many times, but always until now, I really don't have any answer for this. Uh, but what really make me interested about uh, discussion with someone, I really thought that, uh, I don't know when exactly, but she already knows that this is her film, and she's always there like, for Sama, and, uh, but I, th I think that I will let her just, when she will ask me, like, I, I want to watch it. Uh, and I don't think that will be very, very, uh, like, long time. Uh, because, you know, we, when all the people around us, like Salim Afra and the kids always, and these people, we've always have this conversation, and she's now growing up on this uh, talks about what was happening, and Aleppo, and w what's going on until now, and these uh, details. But what I really wa thought that it will be interesting, that I want her to watch the film, let's say, like, each one year or two years, and I really want to hear from her uh, her opinion about that because it will be really different like when she will be 13 from 15 from 18 and from 25 so I really I don't know but this is could be something will be, will will I would love to to, to happen okay thank you thank you thanks for you just a couple more right uh, uh, there's a hand there I believe or else you've got something funny on your shoulder <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right after you. Okay. Oh, hi. 
Um, I'm also from Aleppo, Syria, and I really appreciate this film and everything, and it brought a lot of, you know, refresh, refresh my memory of how home looked like, because I'm starting to forget how home looked like. And uh, as a first, from what I know, it's your first film. I want to ask you, like, um, how you managed to do all of this since it's like your first film, and uh, what difficulties did you face, or what you expected since it was your first film? Uh, like, f f since it started in Syria in 2011, the revolution, I was just, you know, moved and uh, like what was direct me is was my emotion and what, what I was f uh, feeling that it's really amazed me. I was document that moment. And with the time, it was the camera was really part of me and I was just trying to document each moment. Uh, like speci especially, f uh, first of, of all for me personally as a, a woman living there, because I felt that in any moment that this life could be ended when with one attack or one sniper or whatever it was. So I just wanted this uh, life to be saved and maybe someone, when I will be like just killed or something, someone will take this footage and do something with, with this uh, story. Uh, but There's like, another side to it, isn't there? And that is that you turned out to be a completely natural operator with a camera. Yeah. Somehow you, you could compose images and some of the images with which you were attacked, if you like, I mean, those scenes in the in the emergency room yeah. were things you don't see on documentary films because yeah. you don't have any access, precisely because the media are kept out. And as a young filmmaker confronted with these appalling scenes, you managed to keep rolling and, and allow terrible images to pass through your eyepiece without backing off. Yeah. Exactly. So it's it's more about how I was seeing the life there and how I was really with all the suffering, but I was really amazed how the people there like managed to live and how we were managed to live. And in some places I was really shocked like of myself, how I was like strong in some places and other places where I was really like destroyed by maybe something really, really small. So it was, I don't know how this life it's going on, so I just wanted really to document everything around. And in, in one part, the, really the camera was something like um, uh, a wall or a wearer, like, you know, it was, I was feeling that when I make, when I have the camera and when I'm doing this, I'm really strong and I'm doing something and there's really a reason why I, I am there. That's why it, it was really, um, in all the moments, even like when I find out that I, I was pregnant, I, as you've seen it, I've seen it, you know, so I, I really wanted to save this moment and as, as it is exactly for myself first, before anything else. I love that. As you've seen it, I've seen it. Yeah. Actually, as I've seen it, <laughs> you've seen it. Fantastic. Fantastic. John, is it, sorry, I, yeah, I got the microphone I was given because you called both of us at the Keep same going. time. Um, I do have an idea for what we could do to help. And that is to Jesus. do with kinder transport and the thousands of Syrian children who are still left without the support that luckily Sana has had and the good luck of the family. And there is a campaign that Alf Dubs has been leading to get the government to honor its promise to take in thousands of Syrian children and all they have so far is a few hundred. And that's shameful, but it needs every community represented in this room to say to the government, to their MP, we want Syrian children to come to our village and then maybe their lives might change. It's not going to change the Russians, but at least it could give other children what Sana is lucky enough to have with his parents. Thank you could, very much. Could, could I say in addition to uh, getting involved with Alf Dubs' project, um, you have the opportunities you leave this room, I'm only saying this dispassionately, of possibly a rev reviewing how you're going to cast your vote at some point uh, in, in this festival. Uh, so don't forget to do so for whichever film you decide to, to back. <laughs> I do that without prejudice. Um, any other questions? Yes, the very good persistent hand there. There, she must have it next. Oh, God. Uh, can you just Thank stand you. up so they can see sure. you? 
Could, uh, Mr. Redshirt, could you just look at the... Uh, or Miss Redshirt, because I can't uh, see. <laughs> um, um, I just want to say your film was very powerful and very moving. Um, how does it feel for you watching that footage on screen and having to relive all that that you've been through? It was really difficult in the first many times, and then I feel I'm still there <laughs> until now. So it's something really complicated because I, uh, like, sometimes I'm very happy that I'm watching that, um, that I have the feeling that I'm really still there. Uh, and the other thing I will not tell you about, the other side of that, but it's really mixed a lot. Actually, for for me, in the, the like most of the film, I feel proud that we were there. The first time I saw it, there are several, like, scenes that I didn't, realize that that really happened or oh my god I was like when this massacre happened and then I see myself oh my god I was there mm -hmm. because like sometimes I'm obviously like we're just lost in the moment and I really feel proud when when I see what what we were in Syria what we have done what we have achieved all the relationship that we had together the most uh, critical part for me every time that I really don't like to see at the film is the last few minutes when all the rewind memories happen because it's really happened in my head. And I feel like just, like I cried every time, so. Uh, the person, to, if you'd stand up, the, the one at the back there, if you stand up, stand up, then they'll find you. Lovely, thanks. Thank you. For, firstly, I think like everybody else, I'm, I'm almost dumbstruck and trying not to be with power of what you've created, the terrible and the beautiful together. Um, but just a small thing which you probably have thought about in terms of spreading what you, what you know and what you've seen. Um, I wondered if you'd approached all the major um, museums and art galleries because you you have an awful lot of stills and presumably a lot more that could be used I don't Hamza. know if it is anything oh, happening Hamza. like that well, well, I was just going to say yeah that is actually one of our sort of long term impact goals actually is to create uh, some whether it's by tying in with another institution or actually even like setting up something ourselves some sort of foundations which can be a repository uh, for human history, you know, because I think that we all agree that what's happened in Syria and the things that WAD managed to capture with their camera and that these guys lived through is one of the greatest disasters that has affected mankind since the Second World War. And it needs to be remembered. And we need to find a place where we can bring together a lot of the different testimonies. You know, people are painting things, people are taking photos, as you say. There's incredible footage, amazing footage from activists and journalists. And our dream, our biggest dream that we've discussed is to create some place where all of those people, you can bring it all together under one roof and people who don't know about the conflict. And this actually brings back to the point about, you know, the fake news and the distortion, the propaganda, that we could have that as a record for human history, where it's like, this is what people went through. This is what your fellow human beings suffered. And I went to the Imperial Museum in London, and it was really, like, um, like shocked with, for me because I've, I felt like how, uh, how I missed a lot of things, you know, when I was in Syria, and I didn't, like, not just me, but all the other people. We should have something, you know, to bring uh, a lot of things with, which we've seen in Aleppo as... Uh, the rest of rockets or even some like beautiful mem memories and for us as, as displaced people when we left each one uh, brought something really uh, means means something uh, for, for for us and all these people like st st really still have these things as a very uh, valuable things in in their homes until now so i was really thinking about how we can really build the history of the syrian after 2011 which they will be all like fighting in the, the same place the propaganda that the regime was trying to do and this is really one one of the thing which is uh, uh, however or whatever the situation now was or however who is now controlling uh, uh, the land in syria and controlling the uh, the country as country but we are controlling the the great memories that we have as syrians and the biggest 
let's say like creative uh, mem memory we could r really ever have always. So I really would love to have something like this and this is, as Ed mentioned, it's one of the big uh, things which we would love to, ma to make as an impact of the film. Uh, and in terms of perhaps trying to get the biggest audience as possible, uh, Channel 4 will be screening this in the autumn and um, there'll be plenty of tweeting and the rest of it ahead of it. Uh, and if anybody can keep pushing and repeating and retweeting, uh, that would be very, very helpful. That will get it to the widest possible audience in this country, but we're hoping too that it will be shown in many other countries. It would be wonderful if it got shot and shown in Russia, but uh, one, one doubt. We're ready for it. Right. Yeah. So, on, 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 oh, one more here because I can see you. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're getting... We're actually out of time, but we're going to get... I'll talk to you, John, because it's more... Oh, sorry. Um, uh, my um, acquaintance here... Uh, sorry, I... No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We watched a film this morning. I just want to tell everybody, because... Um, uh, sorry, it was called Tiny Souls. Um, it's also in Syria, and it focused on children who uh, were in a, co um, <laughs> a, a refugee camp in Jordan, and... Just want to tell everybody, please watch this. I spoke to the director afterwards. It threw me sideways. Um, the children uh, are back in Syria. They don't know where they are. Uh, and it comes back to the point about the small villages and the towns, which are not getting the... Um, and I, I made this the point. I want to... I said, have you spoke to Channel 4? She says, I wish. So, John, I'm speaking to you directly. Channel 4, please... Please watch this there are documentary. There Channel 4 people here. Yeah, well, that's uh, the request, but that is the... It's called Tiny Souls. It's also I'm being brought I'm I don't get to make any decisions. Okay, but there we go. But the, the big wigs are <coughs> yeah. around, and they're, yeah. they're outside. They heard you now, so, yeah. 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 <laughs> right. So, listen, I, on your behalf, I would very much like to thank, again, Wad, Hamza, Ed. <laughs>